Muy buenas tardes, estamos aquí otra vez en el canal de la Red Cultural. Hoy tenemos el privilegio y el honor de tener con nosotros a el padre de la educación imaginativa, el profesor Kieran Egan. Hi Kieran, this Hi, is an honor for us to have you here in our new TV channel of Red Cultural in YouTube. So thank you to be with us in Santiago. It is my pleasure and I'm honored to be on your channel in YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. People, when I speak about imaginary education, people generally ask me what it is because they just is a, for them it's a new concept yeah. and they do not really understand what is the difference between imaginary education and general education. Can you explain a bit what is imaginary education and what are the differences? Not easily, <laughs> but basically um, it's a form of uh, thinking about education and thinking about educational practice that focuses on engaging the emotions and the imaginations of children in the content of the curriculum. Um, the curriculum, everything in the curriculum is wonderful in one way or another. It's all very exciting. The knowledge is all fantastic. It's the history of our species, developing an understanding of the world and experience. Of, but at the same time, we tend to make it, for the child, often rather dull. You know, we, we organize it into neat little categories and subject areas, and it's not It's not easy then to make it particularly engaging. And what imaginative education is all about really is showing how that content, how we can bring out the wonder and the, and the imaginative engagement in the contents of the curriculum. The everyday materials that we teach are all of them wonderful in one way or another. So it's about how you can see that sense of wonder, how you can bring it to the child's mind. So we have developed lots of techniques, practices, that show how you can take the fact that alternate interior angles of a parallelogram are congruent, <laughs> as one example, which you know often we make rather dull. It's a, it's a task of um, learning some geometry that is not particularly interesting to most children. But it, it has in it with stories about who invented it, why it was invented, what wonders there are attached to that, and embedding it in the context of that sense of wonder from which it came makes it much clearer, much more interesting to students. So we, we try to show with all the topics of the curriculum that you can do this and, and the teacher can shape the way they introduce any kind of um, subject in the curriculum in, in ways that just make it both emotionally and imaginatively engaging to students. So that's the main principle of imaginative education. In some ways, to make the contents again alive, as they were in their time, so because mostly of the things that are, were created by men were created by men with their own lives and feelings and reality. Men and women, yes. And women, of course, but I'm <laughs> yes. speaking in general. Right. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I mean, one of the basic principles we have is that all the knowledge in the curriculum is, is a product of human hopes and fears and passions. And if we want to make it meaningful to children, we have to embed it in the, those hopes and the fears and the passions that either were involved in its generation in the first place or in its use by somebody today. And it's only in those kinds of contexts that the children can see, oh, that's why learning that history is important or that geometry is important. It's really interesting if you put it in those kinds of living contexts. So what we have tried to do is show how you can do that with any area of the curriculum and for all ages. And, And the kinds of contexts that are engaging for children at age five are different from those that are engaging at age 10, which are different again from those at age 15. So we try to show how imaginations develop in a way that also enable us to present the curriculum and see the curriculum differently for children at different ages. And they see the, or they engage with different contents through their life because it's something The general theory generally focuses in, in the difference in development in something biological. But mm -hmm. in your theory, it's not biological. You get different kinds of, you speak about kinds of understanding right. that is shaped by your education. So in Educated yes. Mind, you develop an entire whole theory. Can you explain a bit about that? A bit, yes. oh, but, but yes, mostly sure. related with the, the development of human being through 
Western history because it's, right. I think it's a Western theory more than fit better, I don't think. So. Well, parts of it are. I mean, basically what we've tried to show is that um, human beings, the central feature of education is is the learning of cognitive tools, the tools that enable you to grasp and understand the world. And you get a bunch of tools with a body. So um, it's not particularly Western to have a body. No, yes, of course. And the same with an oral language. Yes. There is a, no a toolkit comes with an oral language, which we call mythic, because it's also true of myth-using cultures, and equally true for us when we're young children, because we, we are using forms of uh, thinking that don't rely on literacy. And, and that's, again, obviously worldwide, everybody has an oral language, and so those forms of understanding are common throughout the world. Yes. And then with literacy, uh, that's further development that um, leads to a whole new toolkit, a cognitive toolkit that comes with literacy that affects how we understand the world. And um, the, there is some variation from different cultures, of course, because different literacies um, break up the world in different ways, slightly. I don't think there's a lot of difference, but there's some difference. So in different cultures, one can recognize some differences, but on the whole, um, nearly all cultures, um, uh, the, the tools that come with literacy are fairly common among different cultures. The next stage is the development of theoretic kinds of understanding, which we call philosophic. Um, and there, the differences are indeed a little bit greater from culture to culture. Um, uh, and the, the final one, ironic, is um, uh, maybe there's most distinction across cultures there. So, so in part, I think what you're saying is true, but, but and also the, the driver of the process is not is, is partly psychological, partly logical, but partly to do with the imagination. So we see the dynamic of the process as uh, constrained by psychology and by logic, you know, what you can learn before other things. Uh, so there is a biological component, uh, basically, as a part of it. But most important is the, the imagination. And the imagination is the greatest driver of our desire to know the world and how we can learn, learn about the world. So the, the complex um, image we have of development is of these three functioning together. Whereas a lot of educational thinking assumes it's a psychological process and, and they, they draw from psychology and assume you can translate fairly directly then to learning in, in schools. And I think that's a mistake that impoverishes what we can actually understand about children and how they learn. And uh, what's the role of language? Because you say imagination, so your imagination grows yeah, with, with the time and because you are educated, but there is something that language plays in that change. Yes, well, I think it's very much a language-oriented theory. Um, and not limited to that, but that's what has been most developed in the theoretical literature so far. Um, and indeed, um, our developments of language, you know, we're a, we're a very strange animal because um, our language and then literacy transforms, we are technologies that transform our thinking. So we become, a, a, we become a creature that is a cultural, we're a cultural animal, but, um, and another feature of this theory that I think is fairly unique, most, most theories of education and theories of development are all about how you get better as you get older. As it <laughs> and, um, and this is a little different because with each step of development there are losses, there are things you, you lose by gaining literacy which gives us all kinds of wonders but there are costs to literacy and, um, and one of those is a kind of alienation from the natural world in some ways that is very hard, we can never recover again. So one feature of this theory is about how you can't go home to your original, as it were, natural condition. So when, when Shakespeare's Polonius says, to thine own self be true, we find it very hard to know quite what that means, you know. What is myself? What is the truth about myself? Because the more sophisticated our language and culture become, the more alienated we come from what might be. See, our cats and dogs and the 
uh, the horses and cows don't have this kind of problem because they don't have this language uh, language sophistication that makes understanding the self difficult for us um, because we're tied into a culture in which we both um, are individual people but we share a great deal that our, our language uh, makes our brains it, it shapes our brains and the minds and the mind is st strange because um, what what is what mostly fills our brains is um, things like language that we share. Neither of us invented the words that we're using, um, but at the same time, we we want to make them ours, but they can never be ours because we're we live in this strange cultural realm where we're. Now this is all a bit gets a bit arcane, but it it, it, it rises out of the, the fact that we that language is one of the big drivers of the process of education that's involved with imaginative education. And as time goes by, our language becomes more sophisticated, and that, that is one of the most important and evident features of the development from what we call you know, mythic to romantic to philosophic kinds of understanding, because each of them involves an increasingly complex uh, use of language. Yeah, but also, we think in words. You some <laughs> to some very large degree we do, but not entirely. No, not entirely because yeah. you have images too. But in order to name that, you put it a word anyway. Yes. Oh yes, that's that's. Yeah, I think language is obviously much more important than often we account. A lot of people want to say that images. You know, a lot of children seem to use images much more, and there are. One of the features of the theory as well is about the importance of stories that are yes. shaping shaping the world through stories. But there are incre there are numbers of children who are in North America they call them buildy buildy boys mm -hmm. that they they have no interest in nearly all boys most commonly boys and they they're not interested in stories they like to build things and make things ah oh, yes um, and and they find they find it hard to understand why people find stories interesting. But, anyway. So, it, while the normal child doesn't have these problems, there are other children who, who, who aren't tied to language in quite the same way, and, and some of the features of language, like stories and all the rest of it, that are, for most of us, the ways in which language develops. We enrich our understanding of the world by shaping it into stories. Which, and the more sophisticated our language, the more sophisticated the stories, the more sophisticated our understanding comes. Yeah, being sophisticated, so having more cognitive tools mm -hmm. in your life, necessarily means that you have to be serious and more, uh, I don't know, boring people, because generally people, for instance, related to be academic, to be very boring and speak very difficult very in dinner. Uh, so, uh, if you if you you can have all this sort of understanding, you can be a probably a mix of it. Of course, yes. And one of the features of the the, the theory and the, the one of the main tools that's a part of it is is the joke. That is humor. We're a humorous animal. And that sense of humour is crucial, it seems to me, to becoming properly educated. That um, people who are serious all the time, well, seriousness is important. Um, yeah, um, sometimes. But at the same time, uh, humour is, is, is a central feature of our being. And particularly in learning some of the more sophisticated tools of language, I try sometimes to suggest to students, as a part of a kind of joke, that they should throw away their literacy textbooks and introduce a half an hour a day of telling jokes to children. Yes. Um, because what, what, a lot of jokes, um, what they do is, is um, they make language visible. Mm. So that one of the things you learn is that language is not just a behavior, but is an object. And the more you, have, you develop that kind of understanding of language and you see it as something you can manipulate, certainly for humor purposes, um, the more sophisticated your use of language can become, and um, usually does become. So humor has more than one level. It has a very um, pragmatic level in 
developing language use, but it also had, but that is a reflection of a more profound sense mm. in which this whole process leads to a sense of irony, which is a recognition of the the difference between what is said and what is meant, and in that in that gap lies yes. an infinite universe of jokes and humour, because in some sense our existence is strange and peculiar and ripe for humour. Is in some way this theory, well, we were talking about language, which one is unique of human being, but also human being is the only one that is free, so, and the freedom is the one that allows you to be, or to take another path of so it's the own nature that is not uh, uh, determined by their nature. So uh, we are the only being that have this sort of wonderful uh, possibility. Yes, but it comes at a cost. Of course. And this is the so, um, and un unfortunately, most people don't think of education and learning as involving costs. They see every every step as a gain. Every advance of literacy is a pure gain, every, every, every grade you go through and pass is a gain. But everyone comes, everything comes at a cost. The aim of education is to maximize the gains and to minimize the costs. And if you're not aware of the costs, you're more likely to incur increasing costs. And that, I'm afraid, is I think what happens a lot in schools, because people don't recognize that there are costs involved in in some of these processes, so they lose more than they need to. So, you know, children lose, for example, a sense of humor. They don't see, not that they keep the humor outside of the learning, but they don't see why that's important in, in learning about geometry and history, and they don't consequently see how the imagination can come into play in, in these areas, and they don't see the sense of wonder that is in the fact that alternate interior angles of a parallelogram are congruent. So all of these things are imaginatively engaging, have a sense of humor attached to them in peculiar ways. And if you aren't aware of these, you are likely to make the whole enterprise a bit duller than it ought to be. Something th that loses that you speak about, it's a, you can, inf I wonder if you can exemplify that in that when you are just oral, an oral person, you can see an image and get a lot of information of that image immediately. But when you are literate and there is an image, you go directly to what is written down, because written down is the most important, uh -huh. oh, yes. uh, I don't know, I wonder if, uh -huh. uh, because uh, I'm thinking, because you explain that your theory has a sort of relationship with the development of the Western civilization, uh, in history, so the idea of recapitulation. Right. And if we're thinking about Middle Age, where people generally do not read, uh -huh. and they were a very iconic mm -hmm. and image centered society. Right. And later on it changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. And I mean, if we talk about, I mean, one has to be careful, obviously, talking about recapitulation because recapitulation theories at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century were led to disastrous social consequences because, because the, the, question, the question is what is recapitulated? And I think in the 19th century, early 20th century, they assumed it was somehow this nobility of human development or, or the knowledge that was re re recapitulated, that what had been invented in ancient Greece and the modern day is recapitulated in the child who goes through it and learns it more rapidly. Whereas what uh, the, the sense of recapitulation in the theory that, of imaginative education is that what's recapitulated, repeated uh, in the child's experience from our cultural history are the cognitive tools. It's, yes. not, it's not the content and it's not yeah. the etc., but it's the, the toolkits yes. that you learn. The way you understand the world. Yes, and that gives you great power to be able to understand it in increasingly rich ways. So, yeah, so that's the. The, the sense, and indeed the, the move from a, a powerfully uh, rich imagistic kind of culture, as in the Middle Ages, to um, one which values uh, the text above all else, 
has its costs, as you're suggesting. Um, uh, and it needn't, of course. I mean, the, the trouble is that we, we tend to value certain things and then assume that what they are in contrast with, we, we suppress the value of what it replaces. And that's part of the history of Western culture. We, we despise what came before in, yes. in one form or another. Um, not recognizing that what we have done is incorporate some of those things in the way we function, and and we lose some of them. So, yeah, um, and and I think in schools particularly that the, the value of the text, the textbook, the what, and I, I think um, one of the things I try to persuade my students is that there's no knowledge in a library. Um, <laughs> there is only there are only codes. You know, there are these written things. There's text. 